is designed to discourage deeper investigation by outsiders, justify any policy decision made by the ruling regime, and of course mask the real ideology of paranoid xenophobic nationalism that defines the country. And this nationalism is explicitly militaristic in character. In 1990, when the late and unlamented Kim Jong-il was promoted to the Commander-in-Chief of the Korean People's Army, this began the evolution of North Korea from a party dictatorship into very much a military dictatorship. So this was so that Kim Jong-il could rule through the military, which he used as his own personal army and alternative structure rather than the state. Therefore, rather than being seen as a traditional communist sort of one-party state, the correct way, I believe in a lot of the research I believe, to think about North Korea, is a sort of totalitarian no-party state, where you've got one leader controlling everything through the military. And so this actually brings us back to um, nuclear weapons. Now, North Korea believes that nuclear weapons would dissuade, especially the United States, but any external country from trying to force regime change in Pyongyang militarily, as was done in Iraq in 2003. And this is where you get the um, Cold War notion of deterrence. Deterrence is a theory that posits that the threat of force will convince a potential aggressor not to undertake a particular course of action due to the costs or probability of the event unacceptably high by the nuclear war. And so when they announced the 2006 first nuclear test, um, in addition to citing the ongoing economic sanctions as a justification for this, the sort of regime in Pyongyang explicitly claimed that they would now have a deterrent against the potential future American aggression. And so this overriding focus by the North Korea on security aligns with the realist conception of international very, very closely. So the realism or real politic is the oldest and most widely adopted theory of international relations. And at its core, realists emphasize the anarchic nature of the international politics with states as the key actors and the importance of power for both relative political advantage and most importantly security. So well, North Korea's true ideology is this unique form of sort of race-based nationalism with a ruling royal family, sort of. Nonetheless, their main priority, the main thing you need to understand about North Korea is because it's the survival and security of the regime. Everything else is subordinated to that. And once you start looking through that lens, that's when you see that the, the idea of a nuclear term actually makes logical sense from their perspective, because they see that as their only way to survive. We sit under the same that had a nuclear weapon, they say, he never would have been invaded. The one with Gaddafi in Libya was investigating a nuclear weapon. The, the West convinced him not to take one up. He aligned himself more with the West in a few years, but then in 2011, when the Arab Spring happened, the West helped remove Gaddafi. And in Pyongyang, they pay attention to this, so they say, if you've got a nuclear weapon, no one will touch you. So, to get back to the economic sanctions then, to assert that economic sanctions are an effective method of influencing the behaviour of target states, in this case North Korea, is to make the claim that there will be a correlation between the magnitude of the economic incentives being proposed or implemented and the expected success of policy. So realists consider that the political and strategic goals of states will always take place over economic ones, this emphasis on state security, whereas the liberals, which is say the Western liberal tradition, expect that the powerful economic stimuli will alter the preferences of and policy direction of the target government. And this is again showing this liberalism comes that sanctions belong in this liberal sort of politics. So when you're looking at how effective economic sanctions can be in changing the certain behaviour of a target state, in this case North Korea's nuclear weapons program, you must take into account the character and ideology of that state. This is because the political impact of the sanctions on the target state's government is more a function of the institutions of the state and how various interest groups within the state are affected by the sanctions and how much they can then push the change of policy that's causing the sanctions to be put on in the government. And the regime, like North Korea, that is practically immune from any forms of public accountability in its actions from a free and independent press to facing uh, the voters at the ballot box, is far more likely to be able to withstand the, the economic pressure of a sanctions regime without the pushing power. So to put simply, in black and white terms as possible, 
you can't bully a dictatorship in the way that you can influence a democracy. Therefore, democracies are more susceptible to economic state, state rather than sanctions than dictatorships. So, what I'm arguing in all of this, the sum of this, is that the, uh, the core assumption behind sanctions, that economic pain will cause the citizens of the targeted state to become dissatisfied with the government and press for change by the ballot box in widespread dissatisfaction, or even in the case of, you know, might say something like Libya, an uprising, that was an expression of dissatisfaction against the government. It, it doesn't really apply to North Korea when you look at the specific character of the state. An autocratic regime doesn't face any domestic serious opposition because of the totalitarian nature of the police state, and that it's not chiefly concerned with the welfare of its citizens, as everybody probably knows North Korea is probably the worst human rights record on earth. It's not susceptible to the kind of political effects that a liberal democracy is when it comes to something like the role of economic sanctions. So there's an ideological incompatibility, I argue, between the liberalism of economic statecraft on one hand and the security focused nationalist realism that constitutes North Korea's true worldview on the other. And the sort of distance between the two and the different ways in which they really work is, I argue, what's responsible for the failure of economic sanctions to achieve their goal, the nuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. So, the repercussions of this theoretical mismatch is that those arguing for implementing the economic statecraft as a proposed solution to the North Korean nuclear crisis, that is to say the policy makers in the West and the UN, to my mind, they don't appear to have actually considered whether or not this policy prescription is likely to or is even capable of producing the desired results. Yet despite this, the ongoing response by the international community to North Korea's nuclear program over the past decades has been to call for and implement ever tighter sanctions. Yet at the same time, when they do try and negotiate, you may have heard of the six party talks between North Korea, South Korea, China, Russia, Japan, and the United States over the nuclear program. They're trying to have a diplomatic solution, yet at the same time, squeezing with these economic sanctions. So, these negotiations you could ultimately describe as pretty much handicapped from the start, even with everything else in terms of And all the available evidence strongly suggests that the use of economic statecraft as a hopeful solution to the nuclear crisis has been put in place without reference to any of this discussing uh, the real ideology of the state and how it functions in the context. So, given that the international community will likely want to remain committed to denuclearizing the Korean Peninsula, I'm arguing that you must first understand the reality of the state before any policy is decided upon. And that this new mode of thinking must replace the current use of off-the-shelf diplomatic tools in attempts to fit a model from other places and times onto what is a unique situation. And I'll just reference one that everyone's pretty much familiar with. Most people know about the part of the South African government and how it was widely believed that the economic sanctions that were put on the apartheid government and the restrictions on sporting tours and various cultural exchanges helped bring about the end of apartheid. Now, this is what I've learned in literature, and I think it's problematic in a certain sense because South Africa was a unique circumstance. You had a, a very minority white led government and a majority black population. And the black population in South Africa were actually cheering on the sanctions and supporting them, whereas in North Korea, it's the state is in complete control in a way that it wasn't in South Africa. And there were other issues in South Africa too, like the, the nationalist government feared that the people, the black population, would join up with communism when, if the apartheid government fell. But after the collapse of the Soviet Union, that ceased to be a problem. And then there was the labour market distortions that were created by the, the uh, apartheid government. And all these unique, specific character of South Africa is why the apartheid regime fell. But if you're trying to understand North Korea today by looking at it through the lens of South Africa in the early 1990s, you're not being academically rigorous. You're not looking at the character of the state as it truly is. Once again, this is an attempt to fit something. It's like hammering a square peg into a round hole. You're not really taking something as it actually is. It's just this imported policy. What do we want? We've got a problem. Let's try and fix it with this. It's exactly the same. As soon as uh, the Crimean situation with Russia annexing Crimea, the first result was to call for sanctions on Russia. There was no investigation to say, will this be an effective way to change Vladimir Putin's way? Do we think this will actually affect 
affect the Kremlin in any way, or will it just hurt the Russian people? It was international problem, sanctions. And so I think that anyone who's concerned about nuclear proliferation and security of the Korean Peninsula really needs to think seriously about these issues because if we are committed to the nuclear rights of the Korean Peninsula, we do need to understand why it was nuclear rights in the first place, what the ideology of the North Korean state is, and only I think then will we be able to have a chance of trying to create some kind of policy to scale back the situation because it was the Pentagon estimate in 1993 said that if the Korean War was to start again, there would be one million casualties in the first 24 hours. So it's an incredibly serious situation in, on, in Korea, even though a lot of people don't think about it. And I think that uh, when you understand the specific character of the regime, then the resulting policy should have a much greater chance of success than failure. And the, the theories of international relations that, that my lot of this thing. They should be there to help you understand a situation, but I don't think they should be used as a policy prescription. So, ultimately, that's my argument: is that the theory exists to help us understand something, but it shouldn't be our first go-to point of call as a solution. And I don't think that policymakers in the United States, the UN, the EU, and even Canberra actually understand North Korea, and that's why. I Without a serious change in the policies, the ongoing nuclear stalemate and the human existence of one of the world's worst human rights regimes will just sit there and the Cold War will ever continue on the Korean Peninsula. Thank you. 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 Thank this is a bit of a bold vision for North Korea about what they imagine reunification would like. If there was reunification, it would involve the eradication of North Korea, not the seamless merging of the Thank you, Nicholas. I will grab Shusei from the University of Warwick to come present on the New Zealand. Amazing. He said, democracy is a system in the country 
was to allow the electorate to vote in order to produce the regime. So in other words, it can be said a democratic country has a government that people vote for and are satisfied with. However, in the previous slide, I said satisfaction is one of the key elements of democracy. The level of satisfaction is quite low on average around the world. This table is taken from a Pew Research Global Attitudes Project in 2012. And as you see in the bottom row, only uh, around 40% of people are satisfied with their country's democratic situation. And if you see the two countries I want to analyze, they also show interesting results. In Egypt, uh, nearly 60% of people are satisfied with their country's democratic situation. Um, however, in Tunisia, 80% of people are dissatisfied with their democratic situation. So in fact, uh, the country which experienced the backlash of the Arab Spring was Egypt. So in this sense as well, um, I'd, I'd like to say focusing or analyzing these two countries would be an interesting research question. So in conducting my research, I faced mainly two problems. And the first problem was how can I select intended variables? And I reviewed previous researches on democracy, or specifically the satisfaction with democracy, and I found two main trends. In the first trend, scholars use institutional side factors as intended variables. For example, whether the country has a president or what kind of election system. And in another trend, uh, scholars use economic side factors as independent variables. So, for example, GNP or GDP or how much people earn on average. But in my research, I use only economic side factors as independent variables. The reason is uh, both Egypt and Tunisia have experienced uh, their spring. And at the time, the public opinion poll data I'm going to use was collected. Both countries were experiencing institutional change, so it is quite hard to measure their institutions. So I only use economic factors. And uh, economic figures are suitable for statistical analysis. So, and these are intended variables I use. And uh, they include two levels and three perspectives. Uh, two levels mean uh, individual level and company level. And individual level, they are taken from questions that are related to the company economic situation. And company level, these independent variables are taken from the respondent's view of their country economic situation. And three perspectives are all related to time. And the first one is the present economic situation. And the second one is future economic situation. So how respondents expect their future economic situation. And the third one is about comparing present and past economic situation. So, since I selected economic factors and uh, intent variables, the hypothesis I got is related to so economic factors are related to the satisfaction with democracy. So now I'm going to show this hypothesis using statistical methods. So there are mainly two ways in political science to uh, show the relation. The first one will be uh, qualitative methods, but since I'm going to use public opinion data, which is quite huge data, so uh, it is best to use quantitative method to analyze that data without uh, losing any data. And I use a binary, I use a method called binary logistic regression. And uh, binary logistic regression is one, one type of regression, and 
it's quite hard to explain all the background concepts. So how simply is to say by using by logistic progression, we can show the relation between the independent and dependent variables. And this slide is the results I want. And there is a figure above the table below, but both show the same results but in a different way. And uh, the results say the all the results are statistically significant. So uh, there is a relation between uh, economic factors and the level of satisfaction with what And finally, I tried to test the result I got with macro data. Because in my statistical analysis, I only use public opinion poll data. So if the result I got are consistent with macro data, they'll be quite strong. And the first macro data I used was GDP growth. And as you see in the graph, uh, Tunisia has experienced lower growth rate than Egypt from 2005 till 2011. And results uh, from my test analysis say country level present and past economic factor relates to the present satisfaction. And as you see in the table, Tunisia has higher dissatisfaction rate. And the second macro data. Macroeconomic data I used was uh, growth rate of GDP per capita. And here uh, the results from my test analysis say uh, individual level now made factor that compares present and past economic situation relates to satisfaction. And there is a steeper decline in the growth rate in Tunisia than Egypt from 2010 and 2011, and that are consistent with the public opinion poll data collected in 2012, shown in the table. So, finally, uh, let's sum up what I said. So, the first last point is about definition. So, to achieve democracy, government is needed, that people hope for, and are satisfied. And the second bullet point is about the statistical results I got. Economic factors do relate to the satisfaction of democracy in new democratic countries. So people are not only satisfied with the fact that they have a new government, a new democratic government, but also they are affected by their view of the economic situation. And the third point is about the kernel of representation. So as we shown in the last part, the statistical results I got are all consistent with the macroeconomic data. So I would say that this method is a useful way to show the relationship between independent and dependent variables. Um, in my university, quite few, only few people, only few students use statistical method in their research, but I want to encourage more and more students to use this method or combine uh, complicated results with complicated results. In their, in their research. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions from anyone? Laura? Um, my question. I think we can all sit down and then not be a big deal. I'll stay out here. Yeah. Is there a good question? Um, can we sit down? It's 